Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed the symposium's exciting event so far. I would now like to introduce the next section of the symposium, which is the Data Science Alumni Panel. And so we have some amazing guest speakers today who we are so thankful to have joining us today. So first off, we have Ms. Asia Spears, who is the founder and principal consultant of Rose Data Studio, which is a data literacy and storytelling consulting agency for Black female data analysts and public healthcare professionals. Known as the Chief Encouraging Officer of Data, her love for numbers is derived from a childhood passion for math turned into a desire to democratize data access and analysis. In 2001, she received her bachelor's degree in mathematics from and she also has a master's degree in biostatistics from UCLA. Next is Samuel Floyd, who is a senior analyst of online analytics and experimentation at Home Depot. Previously, he worked at Accenture and developed data analytics solutions to healthcare. His experiences include analytics, cloud security, data architecture, data engineering, data science, database administration, Python development, security analysis, and SQL development. And in 2016, he earned his bachelor's degree in mathematics and philosophy at Morehouse College. Terrence Pryor is legal counsel of Data's Privacy Operations at data. General Motors. He attended, data he attended the University of Iowa for his undergraduate studies, where he played Division I college football and received his bachelor's degree in anthropology and Japanese. In 2014, he earned his master's in criminal justice and corrections from Clark Atlanta University, where he also played football. In 2020, he earned his Doctor of Law degree in Cyber Law, Data Privacy, and Legal Analytics from Georgia State. And lastly, Dr. Yamisha Bermudez, who is a biostatistician and data manager from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the Data of Cancer Prevention and Control. She also previously worked at the George Washington University Cancer Institute, where she helped to provide technical assistance to more than 50 comprehensive cancer control programs. In 2012, she uh, earned a bachelor's in biology from Spelman College, and in 2014, she earned a master's in public health from Morehouse School of Medicine. And not too long ago, in December of 2019, she earned her doctorate in public health from Georgia State University. So our panelists will now all share how they came into the current position, highlights of how they leverage data science at work, and what they recommend current students to do now to prepare for a career in data science. We are once again so grateful for all of you joining us today and to our speakers. So without further ado, so now here's some remarks from our panelists, starting with Ms. Asia Spears. Welcome and thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Shai. So I'm very excited to be speaking with you all today. I uh, currently am at Rose Data Studio, where I'm really honored to kind of carry out my mission of helping others get more comfortable and familiar working with data. And as mentioned in my intro, I specifically focus on working with Black women and um, honestly recreating some of the wonderful math learning environment that I had uh, while I was at Spelman. And so I'm really honored to do that work and to just encourage and equip others with the skills that they can use to go on to make incredible impacts in sectors like education and public health. And um, before that, uh, though, as I mentioned, I was a Spelman student, a Spelman student, and so graduated in 2011 uh, with my bachelor's in math. And along the way, uh, while I was studying math, I really focused my summer research experiences on statistics and biostatistics. I knew that was an area of interest to me, and I had really great mentors, including Dr. Nagamble Shaw and others across campus and even on uh, the Morehouse campus where I did some research courses. And that initially led me to pursue a PhD in biostatistics uh, as my initial focus for my graduate studies. Uh, however, a few interesting things happened while I was at UCLA. Uh, one is that I discovered I really loved being a TA for introductory biostatistics, so kind of meeting the beginners, showing them how Stata connected to the course concepts and how they could you know, type things in, you know, and kind of really uh, make those connections between the theory and the, what they were writing down and what the code would, would output. Um, the second thing that happened when I was at UCLA is that I completed a summer associate research program at the RAND Corporation. And that was really interesting because I got my first experience not only doing the research, but then also bringing it back to community members. 
the program I worked on that summer was focused on community resilience in Los Angeles County. And we were looking at different networks of community members all across the county and trying to understand how they develop plans and resources so that the next time a wildfire or an earthquake happened, they were ready to go and support their communities. I focused there on not only doing a social network analysis, but also sharing those results back with the community members so that they can understand how they might shift their planning or recruitment to make their network exactly what it needs to be to meet their needs. The third thing that happened when I was at UCLA is that I twice passed my doctoral qualifying exam at the master's level, but not at the PhD level. And the second time that happened, I had to take some time to really think about what I wanted to do next. And so I think this is where I would kind of insert some of my advice for those of you who are considering this field and exactly how you want to engage and interact with it. Um, one is to think about how you can build in flexibility as you're exploring. And so the way I decided to think about um, kind of slowing down my doctoral timeline a bit was to take some classes as pass and no pass so that I had a little more time to think about what my next op options could be. I also decided to test the waters by taking a few courses in economics, in GIS analysis, and in health analytics, which exposed me just to different ways of thinking and working with data beyond thinking about, um, you know, we went, you know, we we thought beyond um, sample size calculations and all these other things that were really um, important and core and fundamental in my biostat curriculum. But I got open to kind of the the other side, like the the world of big data and thinking about how people had so much data that sample size calculation wasn't even something that they thought about as much. It's just you know you you come with with access and opportunity to so much more data. And so the third thing I did was also to think about how I learn best. Um, I'm a visual learner. I'm also a very experiential learner. And I knew that for me, getting hands-on with things was the best way for me to kind of move forward. And so after some consideration, I decided to actually go back to RAND. They have a graduate school called the Party RAND Graduate School. And the PhD program that they offer is in policy analysis. And I thought it was a perfect fit for me because I already love the work that I had done at RAND in the past. And the emphasis was very much quantitative. And so all the statistics and things I already knew were going to come into play again. Um, but it also was this big picture. As, as much as I love public health and the work that we did there, it was also this big picture in public policy of serving and thinking, how do we leverage you know, federal and state resources to also do social good and, and make the best impact that we can? And so I got in, I applied, I got in, and so I left with my master's at UCLA and decided to go to RAND and study there. So I spent three years there, I passed qualifying exams, and then I decided to take a three-year leave of absence. And so during my leave of absence, I actually got some really wonderful big data experience where I worked as a senior population health analyst at a health plan in central Pennsylvania. And it was really wonderful to work with a team of people who were data analysts like me, but who were also different than me. I work with people who had been at a health, one person had been in a health plan, different health plans for over 30 years working as a data analyst. One other person had worked as a medical assistant and a medical coder. So she understood like CPT codes and things in ways that I never could have. And then one other person was really interested in databases and programming and really optimizing our code, whereas I came in with a statistical focus. And so I, I just bring all those experiences with me and I just encourage you as you navigate your journey to, to bring all those things with you, take time to slow down um, and investigate where you can um, and build a great network uh, of people that you can learn from. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Spears. So next we have some following remarks from Mr. Samuel Floyd. So please take it away. All good. And that was an incredible introduction, by the way. Um, yes, my name is Samuel Floyd and I attended Morehouse uh, from 2012 to 2016. 
uh, where I majored in math. And it was more so I came into the dual degree program. Um, but in high school, I've already completed my courses up to Calc 2. So I came in basically as a sophomore with the mathematics department. Um, I generally didn't have an idea of what data analytics was. I wanted to really be an actuary, um, work for an insurance brand. And when I finally did that internship, I didn't like it as much. So I went to IT personnel, and this was with Travelers Insurance, by the way, but I went to the IT personnel and said, well, how can I get involved with this side of the organization? They said, well, we have this database, right? And we need it cleaned. Um, we want to build some reports out of it. And I said, okay, well, you know, I don't know, but I'll get it done. And that will let that is what led me down my first programming language, which is a SQL. Uh, some people call it SQL. And basically you manipulate the data to a point where you can build out reports and also just any type of information that you want to extract from the database. So came back to school and now I had an idea of, okay, this tech thing might be for me. And so I started to take a few more computer science classes, nothing to overwhelm my schedule or my workload, but something to make sure that I did understand what syntax was, what actual, um, what a code base looks like and how to actually develop. And now I went into my internship on um, my second year with Cox Communications. And that's when things start to really kind of buckle down and make sense. Uh, I joined their uh, marketing analytics unit um, as a, just a business analyst. And during that period of time, during that internship, actually, I was able to uh, clean up over 30, 300 of their tables, reconcile those tables into maybe 50 tables and actually map those pieces out. And now what they had was, um, or I didn't even know at the time, what they had was an architecture they can now utilize going forward to all aspects of the, of the organization. And they had a automated reporting structure, which is essentially some scripts and some code in which they can use for when they wanted just quick analysis or they just wanted quick pieces of information. Um, and that actually led me to my senior year. I was at the AUC um, job recruiting um, or the job fair that was held downtown. And um, it was actually a professor who I worked closely with on the, in the computer science department that pulled me to a center. And what that led down was a path of, on one hand, uh, with me joining a center early on and joining within the analytics unit. Uh, I walked into this experience just with my eyes wide open because, again, now I'm working around or I'm working with personnel that have been in the, this industry for around 20 plus years. They also have many project experiences. And now I had the mentorship that I would like to have. And that eventually put me in the position where um, I started taking on projects. So I worked with many of the big players in the tech space. Uh, I did uh, some work on the YouTube account at Google. Uh, I did work with Amazon, Walmart, as well as uh, Barclays, uh, Barclays Bank, along with um, along with te TI, so Texas Instruments. And I think the biggest was with Microsoft. And that was, and I left right, right before Microsoft actually make their expansion to Atlanta. And that goes all to say that, you know, uh, with my experiences and what I picked up uh, initially is you have to have a can-do attitude of just like learning. Um, Tech, especially analytics, it's huge. It's You would not know everything that just comes into play with it. But one thing that you should have is just a can-do attitude of learning and expanding your knowledge as much as you can. Um, so with Accenture, I stayed at Accenture for five years. And um, as, time, as time happened, I grew. Um, I started off as a SQL developer, so just developing SQL, uh, some SQL scripts. Um, and then I moved into Python into Python. And now with Python, you know, essentially I can code from my, Pyth from my Python code, I can actually build out databases. I can actually build out um, SQL scripts through that. 
which eventually led, led me to pick up actually Tableau. And Tableau is a data visualization platform in which I now can build a pipeline where I can automate this code that feeds into this um, visualization tool. They can again, give me a dashboard that I can now report to the executive team. And that is where the value that I saw, how true and rich the analytic experience is. And again, just during that time, I made sure that I kept tabs on my work. I kept tabs on my code and I tried to recreate as much as I can throughout my projects to kind of give me that beneficial factor of, um, of just one, being a learner, an accessible learner, as well as being someone who's who has the experience. So when I do go into an interview, or I do go into a hackathon, I have just something in my back pocket to uh, just add value to. Um, around six months ago, I started with the Home Depot um, organization and I, I'm loosely now what we call a senior analyst and that's essentially just a step right below manager. Uh, I manage a team of analytic developers and what we do is we build out the testing for all Home Depot um, groups. So that's everything from the e-commerce group to doors and windows and what I do is I work with the stakeholders to understand what the test case is. So say if someone say if someone wants to add a banner to a certain page, I will make sure that that's feasible on the software engineering side. One, my if my team has the bandwidth or the capabilities to build that out, and we were tested. So I'm just more so uh, um, I am just more so a subject matter subject matter expert in all of this now. And what we do is um, within that specific team is, of course, like I said, we build out the entire testing platform for the Home Depot group. So we test everything from end to end, from start to finish. Um, I say for now, I have conducted around uh, 75, 70, between 70, 75 uh, tests uh, that is growing, um, growing completely. We just got done with the Labor Day period, and that was just a huge successful win on my part. So a lot of visibility in some teams. Um, and my time is running up, actually. So I would just kind of recap that, you know, this program um, that Dr. Washington has put together, like this has, this is an immense, an immense um, improvement from when I'm there. And this is good because this allows everyone to just have some um, insight into uh, the analytic industries, but also, you know, it connects you. It connects you to personnel, it connects you to mentors. And I would say for all students, please, if you can, take advantage of it. You know, um, I didn't have this come, coming, I didn't have this at my time uh, five years ago when I graduated from Morehouse. But now that you have it, this is a new dynamic and it's something that is fresh and it's good. And I rely and I would charge all of the students to please help build on this. I'm going to do as much as I can on my end to make sure that from an external standpoint, this works well. I definitely want to get a lot of my counterparts at Home Depot involved. But if you can, definitely try to make this program work. Help her whatever you can. Feedback is always necessary. And yes, I would say that uh, I'm appreciative of being here, um, giving a little spout on my experience. But um, again, I'll pass it over back to Shia so she can take it over. Thank you so much, Mr. Floyd. Thank you for that wonderful advice. You and Ms. Spears have given some really inspiring advice that I'm sure is really connecting with students right now. So to continue on with this amazing advice, I'd like to pass it over to Mr. Terrence Pryor to give us his remarks. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Hey, sorry, sorry about that. I'm a, I'm an IT guy, but I'm not I'm not too computer savvy. <laughs> um, no, I'm just joking. Uh, so my um my story to to get into data analytics and, and IT in itself is kind of a it's a little unorthodox actually. So um, first of all, let me say this: I, I see I'm the only Clark Atlanta University uh, alumni here, so I, I have to I'm, let me hold it down, do a good job. <laughs> no, no offense to Sam and, and, and uh, any of the other folks. Uh, I'm just joking with you guys, but. Like I said, it, it was unorthodox for me to get into to computer science and into uh, IT. 
uh, I originally, like like um, the introduction said, I originally started with a criminal justice major uh, at Clark Atlanta University. I was getting my master's there. Um, and, and playing ball, and when I got done, I had um, I had uh, tried to apply for a probation officer job, but I had to have surgery on my shoulder due to, you know, just the years of playing, and I, I wasn't able to pass the physical examination there. Um, so when I got out of school, when I graduated with my master's, I had a 3.75, you know, I had did everything that I thought I was supposed to do, but the areas that I wanted to get into as, as far as criminal justice, I couldn't get into them because I, I just couldn't take the physical test. So I had to take some time off um, to kind of just get get my head straight and figure out what exactly it is that I wanted to do uh, with my career. Um, so during that time, right, I, I was, I had, I had took out a loan right out of school and I was kind of living off of that loan. Um, for, 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 I guess I would say a good seven months. And I was kind of thinking like, man, I, I got to make something shake here. So I went to the, the AUC uh, career fair. I went to the AUC career fair. And when I was in school, I used to, I used to be an RA and there was this guy, I used to RA at the student center. I don't know how many of you all uh, know the, the Clark Atlanta student center, but I used to RA there at the student center. And there'd be this guy that would come every day. He would sit next to me. He would just, you know, use the internet. He, he would be there to use the, the school internet. Um, so over time, me and him kind of built a rapport. We were just talking. His, his name was Bright E. Kegway. Um, and we would just talk and things of that nature. He was telling me he was computer science, uh, math. He was getting his master's in computer science. I told him criminal justice. Um, but, you know, we had kind of just stayed in touch then. So at that career fair, uh, fast forward, I went to that career fair. Um, I was walking around and I had saw him. And he had told my cousin that also went to Clark that he was going to give my cousin a job. So when I saw him, he was like, hey, man, you know, where's your cousin? Is he, is he here? Is he, is he around? And I was like, you know what, man, honestly, I don't know where he is, but I could use a job, <laughs> right? I said, I, I could use a job if you have anything for me. Uh, he was like, you know, you, you got a master's? I said, yeah, I got a master's in criminal justice, though. It's not IT. He said, you got a master's? You got a 3.75? I said, yeah. He said, okay, I think I could do something. So he, he introduced me. He was working at GM at the time, and he introduced me um, to one of the head recruiters there at GM that was over the, the HBCU recruitment. And um, from there, I, you know, I kind of just played played the role. Uh, you know, I, I did my research on data science. I did. I took some of the, the free courses that were out there. And I wasn't, a, a, you know, a, a master at it at all. But I had at least gathered enough information um, to, to interview well. And, and I did. So I went into the interview. I interviewed well. And, and, and they brought me on. They brought me on uh, to the General Motors IT department as a QA analyst without any IT background. So, you know, to me, I, I was kind of like, man, I, you know, I hit it. I, I hit my I hit my uh, my stride. This is where I'm at. This is where I'm going to be uh, for, for the rest of my life, man. You know, I can't believe I got into IT because it was it was something that had just changed my life. You know, I was going to go to be a probation officer uh, and make it around, uh, I think, twenty five to thirty thousand dollars a year doing strenuous work to now being in IT uh, without any background. But, you know, making. A, a, a much more uh, livable uh, wage. So, you know, to me, I was kind of like, man, this, this changed my life. Um, but when I started, I was kind of like, you know, I put you know, two years into a master's in criminal justice, so I kind of don't want to let the law go. So what I decided to do while I was at, at uh, General Motors, I said, well, hey, you know, I think I went to my manager. I said, hey, I, you know, I think I'm going to go to law school as well. And he was kind of like, what? Like, why would you go to law school? You know, you, you just started here. You don't have an IT background. Why would you go to law school? And I was just like, man, you know, I, no one no one knows it. No one can see it yet. But I see the intersection between law and IT, right? You know, IT is going to be involved in everything that's going forward. Uh, data science is going to be involved in everything that's going forward. And the law is just slow to catch up, right? But eventually it will. Um, so my, my, my manager was really cool about it. He was like, hey, as long as it don't interfere with work, um, you know, you, you could go ahead and go to school. And General Motors had this program at the time where they would uh, do tuition reimbursement. So I started that program. I started General Motors in, in January 2015. And then I started law school in August of 2015. And I was just, you know, trucking along, getting through the first year of law school and things of that nature, which wasn't data, data science or uh, anything like that specific. It was just teaching you the basics. But eventually, like I said, IT and law kind of came together. They, they, they intertwined. And, and Georgia State had offered this uh, course called Legal Analytics. And then I was there. I'm like, man, this is perfect, right? It's, 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 it's a blend of what I do every day and what I want to do uh, going forward. So I began to do the, the Legal Analytics class, and I just learned so much about how 
data science and text mining and things of that nature can be introduced to the to the legal world where you know we have all of this raw data you have cases you have judgments from, from all of that raw data to kind of predict cases predict what judges might do so on and so forth and it fascinated me uh so i was just like man this is it this is this is what i'm going to do um and then i uh from there i, I from there in law school i got a internship with coca-cola uh, company uh there in atlanta and I got as a, as a data privacy attorney, and I was kind of like, you know, this is a little separate from legal analytics, but it still dealt with that. Um, it still dealt with that that law and 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 and, uh, and, and data. So I did that. I finished that internship. Um, I, I eventually took the bar. Uh, I met with an attorney at, at Georgia State. I mean, at General Motors, and I told him, hey, I'm about to transition over to to the IT. I mean, to the legal team from IT, and everybody was like, no, it's not. It's not going to happen. You have to go get some firm experience. Uh, but, you know, I, I stayed with it. I stayed fast. Uh, but when I graduated past the bar, I went back to that attorney and I said, hey, you know, you told me when I when I passed the bar to at least come talk to you. And I did. And eventually, you know, it was the right moment at the right time. They they decided to bring me on to the legal team at General Motors. I was going to be focusing on data privacy, which was exactly what I did at Coca-Cola. Um, and, and everything worked out perfect. Uh, and, and so that to me, data science and, and IT really did change my life. Uh, you know, people ask, well, how do you use data science now in your work? It, data science is in everything. And, and I had the foresight to see that. Uh, and that, that's one thing that I will explain that I will hope to push onto the students, man, have foresight, have the ability to see things in the future. You know, don't just look at things as they are now, look at things as they might be five years down the road. Um, so I was able to do that. And luckily when it happened, uh, the role opened up in General Motors. So every day, uh, I don't, I'm not doing text mining and things of that nature, but because I have that knowledge, I can counsel the business uh, partners that we have that do do that, right? That, that tell me, hey, I'm bringing data into a data warehouse. What are some of the privacy implications about that? And and, and I can counsel them, counsel them with that. There's other ways that it works. You can use knowledge, knowledge management, which is you can take your experience in law and IT and tell law firms or companies, hey, these are some of the new technologies that are coming out. Or there's data governance. You can use your knowledge of law and, and, and data texting and mining and say, hey, these are what we need to do to be compliant with the laws. So I, I'll, I'll end it with this. My recommendations for, for students, uh, excuse my time, it just went off. My fiance is walking in the background. Uh, my, my recommendation for students, man, is to, is to first and foremost, build your network. Because, because without a network, I would not be where I am today. I wouldn't even get into data science without the network. And I wouldn't have gotten into law without a network. Um, so we need blacks and in, in, in IT is very important. Uh, and never be afraid to ask questions. You know, my entire career in IT, I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, so I had to ask questions all the time. But that's what got me to where I am today. Um, so always, always build that network. Never be afraid to ask those questions. And, and it, it'll take you a long way. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Pryor. I love how you came from a non-traditional background, and I love how you figured out a way to blend what you wanted to do along with data science. That really goes to you don't have to give up what you want to do for that. So thank you so much for that. So now no we have Dr. Yamisha Bermudez to come and talk to us about her remarks about what she does. So thank you, Dr. Bermudez. You have the floor. Hi, everyone. I just want to start by saying I love how diverse the use of data is. Um, just hearing everyone's experiences and the careers that they're in, it's um, actually pretty fascinating. Um, but I started Spelman in 2008 as a biology pre-med major. I was really interested in the sciences, and my plan at the time was to become an OBGYN. Um, although I was really interested in the sciences, I also really loved math, and I was extremely good at it. In fact, during my freshman year, I looked into minoring in math. However, I quickly let that idea go when my advisor told me um, it would take an additional year to graduate um, and the math minor wouldn't even be listed on my degree. Plus, I wasn't even sure how the whole math thing would fit into my future as an OBGYN. Um, but throughout my matriculation at Spelman, I realized that I actually didn't want to be an OBGYN and that I became more interested in clinical research. <clears throat> particularly cancer research. Um, I felt I finally discovered a field of study that somewhat married medicine and math. So that was exciting. But culturing genetic mutations in a petri dish still didn't um, do it for me. 
it was still something missing and it wasn't the perfect fit. So I expressed my concerns with the infamous Dr. Rosalind Bass, if you all are familiar with her. Um, and she suggested that I look into a field of study called public health epidemiology um, and check out the program at Morehouse School of Medicine across the street. Um, so that piece of advice was a game changer for me. Um, after reading into the field of, a little bit more, I decided that epi was my niche. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with epidemiologists, we use descriptive and statistical research methods to determine how diseases are distributed across various populations um, and also to determine what are the factors for getting this disease or experiencing worse outcomes related to the disease. So I mastered this field of study at Morehouse School of Medicine, learned lots of epidemiological, statistics, coding, survey analysis, and intervention evaluation skill sets and received my MPH um, there at Morehouse School of Medicine. And then I went on to work at George Washington Cancer um, Institute in DC. Um, I stayed there about two years, um, and then I applied for my PhD in epidemiology at Georgia State University. Um, so during my PhD program, I worked as a second century um, initiative doctoral fellow and focused on spatial population health research using big data. My research focused on applying epidemiological and advanced geospatial methods to investigate racial and geographic disparities in breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer outcomes. Um, using these same skills, skills, uh, skill sets, I also um, carried out my dissertation research on multi-level access to care barriers impacting stage at cervical cancer diagnosis and disparities in the U.S. So I added lots of geospatial skill sets using QGIS and GEOTA software, and I also further advanced my bio biostatistical encoding skill sets using SAS software. So just before defending my dissertation and graduating with my PhD, a former GSU classmate who had went on to work at CDC recommended me for this data manager biostatistician program. And for those of you who are familiar with CDC, um, a lot of the biostatistician and epidemiologic um, positions, they kind of go hand in hand. So the title is biostatistician, but I am an epidemiologi uh, epidemiologist <laughs> by training. Um, so I went on to work in this division of cancer prevention and control um, within the program services branch. And I've been there um, a little over three years now. Um, as a data manager on our evaluation team, I'm responsible for evaluating the effectiveness and efficacy of two national cancer screening programs um, aimed at partnering with health systems to increase cancer screening rates and reduce cancer disparities in impoverished and underinsured populations. Um, you guys may be familiar with these programs. It's the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program and the Colorectal Cancer Program. Um, so as a part of my evaluation, I managed the collection and quality of clinic level data for both programs. Using this collected data, I also employ both descriptive and analytic methods to assess program implementation, program management, and program success. Um, and I also routinely develop standard data quality and performance indicator reports contribute and contribute to publishable manu manuscripts. For example, um, I'm currently lead author on a manuscript looking at the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the change in cancer screening volume among the women in our program. Um, and also looking at the effect of COVID-19 on follow-up of women with abnormal screening result results. Um, so this study will be carried out using spatial epidemiological methods, which I mentioned a little bit before, which is pretty cool because it conveys, conveys descriptive and statistical results through mapping to easily show the variation in results across geography. So if you've seen all the maps that have come up through the pandemic, that's another way the field um, of epi uses data. Um, I really love the work that we do. I believe it's important in epidemiology epidemiology is a field I really wish um, more minorities would look into. So I'm really happy that we're having um, this type of symposium to um, it, um, let others know about these different fields. Um, however, epidemiology is just one field of study that leverages data science. You guys may be interested um, in one of the others presented by the panelists today, um, but the use of data is bridge with a number of fields and careers. If you're participating today, that means you're interested in data science, but my advice would be to figure out the second thing that you're interested in and bridge that, um, the two of them together. 
once you've done that, you'll have a better idea of what careers you'd like to pursue. Um, you then be able to seek mentorship from someone in the field and possibly gain access to their network of past and current colleagues. Um, and again, once you've identified a specific field of study, you could also start to attend conferences that focus on research in that area of study, network at these conferences, and learn about the software packages that are most often used across the different organizations um, and become more comfortable using them. Um, I, I believe someone mentioned using Tableau. That's also something that we use um, in, in my field. I, I remember, um, I think it's Asia, she mentioned using GIS or mentioned that. So that's also something that we, we use. So there are a number of different platforms and softwares that are used. So once you figure out what you want to do, you can kind of focus in on those softwares and become more comfortable using them. Um, so that's my advice there to network, start attending conferences, find a mentor. Um, and I really hope this information was helpful for you guys. If epidemiology is something that sounds of interest to you guys, please feel free to email me. Um, with any questions, I'd be happy to discuss further or see how I can point you guys in a direction of different job opportunities. I know that's the, you know, the purpose of this symposium today. So I really hope that you guys find it helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Ramirez. I really love your advice about bridging things together because there are so many different fields out there, but there are also so many fields that you can combine. So sometimes mm -hmm. you just don't have to choose. So now that we've concluded our remarks from our panelists, now is the Q&A session. So if any of you guys have any questions, please feel to put that in the Q&A and I'll ask our speakers. We did such a good job. No questions. We answered everything. <laughs> oh, Samuel, I can't hear you. I think your mic is muted. Got you. Yeah. Oh, that was like, yeah, it's Friday too. So <laughs> I'm not sure if market is popping right now. <laughs> That's probably what they're thinking about a question if that's okay with you guys and this can be a general question and anybody can feel free to answer it so one thing that really stood out to me at least for me um, I am a third year PhD biomedical sciences student who is interested in data science and so my school doesn't really do a lot of data science related things and so just for somebody who's kind of learning this on their own how can you feel like you're prepared to go out into the workforce for something that you're just learning on your own without any formal training. Um, anybody else wants to take up that? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take yeah, a stab at it real quick. Yeah. Because I, I um, like I said, I, I, I didn't have the, the IT background and I, and I really did study it on my own before before I got my job, right? I, I think that you when, when the way to be confident in that is to be confident in all of your other skills that you bring to the table. That, that's one thing that I learned around uh, IT, you know, is when I didn't know what I was doing, I knew what skills I did have and I brought that to the table. And, and, and my managers and everybody was able to see it, right? And they, and they knew because they said, we, you know, we can teach you IT. That's that's nothing. And that's 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 easy to, to learn. We can't teach you the intangibles, communication. We can't teach you the intangibles to, to you know, how to send an email and things of that nature. So uh, when you're out there studying it on your own, you know, learn it, learn as much as you can, but don't forget about the other skill sets that you have that are going to enhance your ability to do IT. Agree with that. And I would add on for me coming out of having, you know, studied and worked with data, but then going to get my first industry job. The one thing that was really different about that compared to research was that I had to pull my own data from the database. And so suddenly SQL was very important, whereas I had never had to know it before. So I got on Coursera, I found my class. And I think for me, what helped was um, being able to communicate that I understood like a data project life cycle. And I said, okay, this is you know, a step at the beginning. And once I have the data, you know, I'm trained to do all these things. And so I think for me, understanding that context and how is data moving through the company and the organization and what stage is it at when it gets to your team uh, was really helpful in kind of knowing how to position myself in interviews. Yeah. And just to 
add on to what they said. Um, I don't think in some cases you're going to ever be prepared, right? And But that goes back to, again, um, as Terrence said, having that confidence. And, and basically, like I said, um, that's where mentorship comes into play as well, too. And that's why mentors are um, a huge. Um, because mentors, like, they – they help you see the forest where you only see the trees. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, uh, that's where things came more so really grounded for me when I started consulting is I had to find a good mentor because um, on one hand, the work was just becoming just slight, you know, slightly overwhelming. But again, they talked about, okay, what are the long-term goals that you do? This is a, this project is just a small speck in the area of your career, right? But this can help, you can compound on this project to do other things as well. So confidence is a big thing. Knowing, again, knowing what your, um, I guess knowing what your strengths are. Um, like I said, those soft skills, those soft skills really do matter. Like I said, I work with devs all day. I work with a, com a combination of devs that like to get, hop on a call, some just like email, some like I am, but they are never those type of debt, but they're never the type of devs to actually go to a stakeholder and say, and when he says, break this down, they just know how to do it, right? So that's where I come into play. And that's where I found my, my I guess my niche where I can communicate those outcomes in more of a, I would say in more of an elementary based fashion. So um, yeah, but you will never be prepared. And honestly, but confidence and knowing what your strengths are, those intangibles will really carry you a long way. So I just want to add to that, no matter how much education you have or how many skill sets you've honed in on, you'll still have imposter syndrome when you get um, into your position. I mean, I, I still had it even with my credentials. I'm like, OK, can I really do this? So I think having the confidence and reminding yourself of all the things that you do know and then focusing in on all those things, um, as the others have mentioned, is really, really important. And also just to reiterate what I said before about mentorship. So identifying a mentor, asking them, hey, what's the software that you most often use on your job? Um, OK, do you have any resources that I can kind of brush up on those skill sets and kind of teach myself? Um, so that's the importance of having a mentor so they can kind of guide you so that you're not wasting time on some, some of the other softwares that may not be used as much. Um, so I think that's a really uh, important thing as well. So just I you know agree with everyone else. Confidence and mentorship is really important um, and kind of brushing up again on those softwares. I think that's really important. I know with the CDC, they sometimes have external trainings that um, th that's open to the public and guys can register for those and kind of brush up on different skill sets. So um, just being really vigilant about those opportunities and seeking those opportunities as well. Thank you all so much. So we do have a few questions popping in. So the first question is, how should a student network at this virtual event today, and who should they reach out to? Well, I'll, I'll start. I'll kick off this question. Um, I think you guys should reach out to the people that um, are kind of in the careers that you're interested in, right? Um, again, we've talked about mentorship. So if you're interested in a particular um, field and one of us are, you know, in that field, hey, give us a, a buzz. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have shared our email addresses. Um, but, you know, this could probably be a start to a mentorship um, relationship, a mentoring relationship. So, um, I, again, reach out to the people who are doing what you plan to do or what you think you're interested in. I agree with that. And I would say personally for me, LinkedIn is a great way to reach out and connect with me. Um, and I would say that, you know, others, uh, I've already gotten a few messages from others who are here attending today. And so for me, that's a great place once this platform is, you know, the day is done to, to stay connected through LinkedIn. It's a great way. And one uh, kind of script that I've used is just to kind of say, you know, hi, and just a quick message of how you found the person or where you met. So, you know, loved your talk today at the AEC Data Science Symposium. Uh, I see we share an interest in Tableau. I'd love to connect and follow your journey and then kind of go from there. 
um, and also ask if there is an ask to, you know, I'm thinking about applying to grad school. Uh, one thing that I did want to share, I didn't have time to share, is that I actually just this fall decided to go back to my PhD program in policy analysis. And so happy to talk about graduate applications, although it has been a long time since I took the GRE. And so maybe I'll have to find another mentor to support you with that. Um, but I'm happy to connect via LinkedIn. I would just add, um, I, I'm seeing in the chat there are a bunch of different uh, resources here on, on the use to, to network. So you know, make sure you take advantage of that. But I, I have a really hard time networking. I know I was saying, hey, network. I have a really hard time networking because sometimes I feel like it's uh, unauthentic. Like it, you know, you're not being real. So what my biggest advice in networking is just be genuine, right? Be be genuine in, in what it is that that you're looking looking to get from from the person you know don't just come and say hey i want to use you for this but you know say hey i'm you know i'm coming to you i want to talk to you about this and this is what i want to know um you know or this is what i'm, I'm looking to see if i can get help from and, and that goes a long way so 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 make sure uh you're, you're genuine and um and, and try to try to try to form a relationship man you know I, like i said all all of my progress came from meeting somebody at the student center right or or you know, talking to an attorney just on a day-to-day -day basis, saying like, "Hey, this is you know, I'm about to take the bar. How can how, what what are some of the tips that you have? Form that type of relationship, and you know, just let it go where let it do what it do, baby. It it it'll go where it goes." <laughs> Actually, have something else to add to that. So, um, during my um, talk, I kind of mentioned that a former student from GH GSU in our uh, PhD program recommended me for the position, but I still had to interview. Um, and the cool thing about the interview was the um, supervisor that interviewed me. I actually met her at a conference, and we had the most random conversation about I don't even remember what it was, but. I was so nice that she remembered me. She said, hey, we had the conversation by the bathroom at the conference. And I was like, yeah, that was me. And it had nothing to do about our work or cancer or anything, but she remembered me. And I really think that just having that weird conversation and just sparking up a conversation about anything at a conference kind of helped me get the job because it kind of gleamed to my personality and she saw that I was a good fit for the team. So when you go to these conferences, I remember how it was. It's like, you know, you're walking around, you're like, who wants to talk to me? Are you nice? Like, People don't bite. Just be yourself and start a random conversation. You never know, you know, those people may be across the table in an interview and, you know, it could work out in your favor. So, you know, don't be bashful or shy away from things. Just open up a bit and just chat. <laughs> that. Thank you so much. So we have another question that says, for those who are new to the field, how do you figure out which aspect of data science that you will love? a good one on that. So I mentioned that I took a health analytics course. That course started at 8 a.m. And I actually realized looking back um, a couple months ago, I didn't realize that class was at 8 a.m. because I loved it so much. I was so excited to get up to learn about how all this data was being collected by healthcare systems and hospitals and to learn how to use, that's where I learned how to use Tableau. And so I would say kind of look for those things that, you know, if you're reading about different data science topics and something just kind of catches your eye and you have that kind of a feeling like, hey, I really want to dive more into that. I'd say kind of follow that hunch and, and see where it leads you. Um, but I think for me that that 8 a.m. class was was definitely a sign um, that that data communication and visualization was something that I wanted to focus on more. Okay, if no one has any other remarks, we would also like to ask another question that says, what are the steps to enter into the PhD program for epidemiology? Their background is a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology, and they're currently in Morehouse School of Medicine's Biotechnology Master's program. Steps of applying for the PhD program, um, as Asia mentioned, across most uh, PhD programs, you have the um, take the GRE um, and write a, this has been a while, sorry, <laughs> um, write a letter of interest. Um, I think one of the good things to do before applying to a PhD program is to look at the current researchers um, and to see who's doing what research and identify the um, 
the professor that you like to study with. I think that's really important. That kind of sets aside PhD programs from MPH programs, kind of identifying a mentor in the beginning. Um, I know that's what I did. And I said, you know, I wrote in my letter of interest that um, professor so-and-so is conducting this research. I'd like to add to their research by, you know, doing this. So um, kind of identifying a person and, and mentioning them in your um, in your letter of interest. Um, what else did we have to do? I think those are kind of the main things, the GRE and your um, letter of interest and of course your GPA and um, those things. But I think those are kind of going in with a, a, a research line of focus. Um, if you don't have a research line of focus, then it's kind of like, what are you really getting a PhD for? So, um, you know, just identifying that early on instead of going into the program and then trying to figure it out as you go. That's how people end up, you know, in the program for seven years and they're still trying to figure it out. Um, but if you go in knowing exactly what you want to do, what type of research you want to do, um, who has that type of data, right? Um, so I knew I wanted to do cancer research. Um, I knew I, I wanted to learn more about geospatial analysis. So I, I knew right away who would be a good fit for me. Um, that also helps you determine which program you actually want to apply to, um, because not every program has that specific um, type of research. So um, I think that's my number one piece of advice. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Bermuda. Oh. Yeah, I was just to kind of tie that into to the last uh, last question. I, I tried to get off mute, but I wasn't quick enough. Uh, <laughs> um, she she said she kind of knew she went in knowing, hey, I want to do cancer research. So, so someone said, well, if I'm new to data analytics, what what how do I know where to get started? Follow your passion. Like fo follow your passion and, and make it make sense. Like you know if. If you want to say, for instance, me, right, I, IT, law, criminal justice, like, you know, people are like, how is that going to make it? How's that, how does that make sense? See, have the foresight, see what you want to do and say, OK, you know, this is my passion. So let, let me let me go and make it happen. Like I said, data science and IT is in everything. You, you can you know, you can do everything and anything and it's going to be an IT a data science team behind it. So find your passion and then bridge the gap. That, that was that was a good, good advice, Yamisha, the uh, bridge the gap. I like that. And just kind of, you know, uh, set that part uh, on that. Yeah, like you said, um, honestly, we have we have so many vast experiences up here. But guys, we're not even touching the baseline of what data is. Like to be fairly honest, though, I have a friend that works at NASA or used to work at NASA, where he will take flight projections from all of the shuttles, and basically he would predict if something were to go wrong. He would have to predict over like 100, 200 scenarios on how to get everyone to land back to safety, though. Um, it's banking, it's healthcare, it's tech, it's insurance, it's public, it's public health, it's uh, on the federal level, too. It's just so many vast opportunities. And that's what we're saying is these opportunities are out there, you know, and it's just a matter of one hand, what do you want to do? Like, what areas do you want to go into? And that can change in five to 10 years as well. But the thing that remains there are those practices and those skills that you obtain over time. So. Thank you all so much for that. So we have one last question from a student who asked, what was it like going into data sciences and thinking like a data scientist? My background is in biotechnology, and I'm just now exploring data sciences as a PhD student. And what what is it like to go into data science and thinking like one, like that? The, okay, the first time, uh, I, I, I'll say I, it. It kind of. I'm, wow, I, didn't I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, like when I when I went in, it was kind of like. I had went in and I had put in all of this when I went into law. It is, I'm sorry. When I went into law, I had put in like six years of IT. And then yeah, when I got out, out and I went into law and they start asking me these questions, I, I knew what I was talking about. I was like, man, this is this is nice. Like it's, it's good to not feel like I'm making something up off the top of my head and I got to spit it out. So I think that's that's the to answer your question, whoever asked, I think that's the feeling that you have. It's like you go in there. Um, someone's going to ask you a question and you're going to know the answer. And then you're going to be like, 
you know what? I think I can do this. I'm not going to know everything, but I, I, I think I could probably make, make my way. Um, and and that's, that's just a good feeling. And you hold on to that. And so when, when the times come when you don't know the answer, you just say, well, I know I, I, know, I know something. <laughs> you know, I know I know something. I don't know everything, but I do know something. And, and that's a good feeling. When I got to work in, at the health plan and I'm like, oh, my gosh, we have all this administrative claims data, this huge database, you know, big to me uh, database. And I realized, well, you know, all my research skills still come into play thinking about how do we design studies to a answer these questions about population health outcomes. And so I had this I almost couldn't even stop like writing down questions and thinking, oh, that's this data set and that's going to tell us this. And I just kind of had this explosion of like research design experiences that I just got to write about and kind of propose as, as um, topics that we could look into because in healthcare, the whole focus now is really shifting more toward value-based care and saying, what is the value that you're getting out of seeing this clinician or that clinician? I'm like, well, we can use data to show us and I know how to do that. And so I had a very similar experience of like, oh, this is really fun. <laughs> I wanna add to that too. Um, to remember just because you're entry level or you're in an entry level position doesn't mean you don't have anything to add. If you have an idea, it could be innovative. Just, you know, let others, um, you know, make them aware of what you're thinking. Put your ideas out there on the table. Don't say, hey, I'm entry level. They've probably already done this before. Someone has already thought about this. Like, you know, don't diminish your ideas. Um, definitely, you know, speak up. You never know. Um, this could be something that needed to be contributed, you know, a long time ago to make your work site better, but you're finally there to add to the job site. And so make sure that, you know, you actually speak up and, you know, don't shy away just because you're entry level. I think I'll just add to that is that to me is the importance of diversity in this field is that we all come from a different perspective. And I kind of touched on that with the people who were on my team. We all use SAS and we have the same title, but we had had such vastly different experiences that when you brought us all together um, and asked us each to, to kind of take our approach to working on a project and you add it all together, you got something much more incredible than what any of us could have done on our own. And to kind of fill in that part, um, I would say that uh, try not to look at data science or data scientists as like uh, like the small group of like people who just do. Because I work with some data scientists, some who program, some who don't. There are some who are more conceptual. There are some who are theoretical. There are some who go into meetings, they ask the questions of, OK, why are we measuring this? And there are some who are just saying, OK, well, it's not going to show us much of significance when it comes to statistical data. So we just need to, you know, do this. Or some people were just like, hey, you know, let's view the anomalies and like let's tackle those when they're there. So data science or data scientists, it's um it's just really it comes down. I'm speaking from more of an industry standpoint. Um, it boils down to on one hand, um, how is the data being looked at? How the data is being valued? How it's being combed over? And um, sometimes, you know, you don't have to be a data scientist. You know, you can start off um, as a data analyst where you can get your, you know, your bearings, you can get your feet wet, you can get an understanding of how the data is portrayed. But usually data scientists, at least from my perspective of where I worked at, they're more so the they're more so behind the scenes figuring out, well, how can we make these metrics important to the organization? How can we grow revenue? How can we show value? So. Thank you all so much for that. So it is now four o'clock. So I wanted to thank our speakers so, so much for taking the time to come out and talk to the students. Each one of your stories was so inspiring. And I hope that to our audience and our attendees that you all benefited from this as well, because I know that I did. So now I'll pass it off to Ms. Gardner and Dr. Washington for some closing remarks and where to go next. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you to all the panelists to um, Rep represent the four pillars here in the AUC. Y'all are doing amazing work and you give some great ideas and a great way for us to see 
for our students to see what the future has in store for them. So thank you all for sharing. And Shai, fantastic job. Thank you for moderating. Our amazing president of the AUC Data Science Club. Great, great work there. I'm gonna